Tonight, we are grateful to welcome Seattle Escribe, a nonprofit organization that supports Spanish speaking writers based in the United States, especially in the Northwest. They are a volunteer driven organization that helps writers carry out their craft regardless of their stage of training, and they provide resources for writers to start and develop their writing through classes, workshops, and readings entirely in Spanish. Please join me in welcoming Alfonso Mendoza, the president of the board of Seattle Escribe. Tierra, trágame. Si un día me ves desfallecer antes de volverlo a intentar, si un día te parece que mi fe se empieza a quebrantar, si un día al despertar notas que he dejado de soñar, si un día mis manos dejan de crear, tierra, trágame antes de claudicar. Ana Evelyn García. Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you very much to all of you for being here with us in this joint event between Town Hall Seattle, Hablemos Escritoras and Seattle Escribe. You have just heard a fragment of a poem written by Ana Evelyn Garcia, one of the co-founders members of Seattle Escribe, that to me, together with some initial poems, stories, and novels born in 2014, symbolize the start of this large group of writers. Seattle Escribe is a group of Latinx writers living in Seattle and the state of Washington that has been offering free courses and workshops since 2014 and has grown to be the greatest group of writers in Spanish in the Northwest. Resources to develop a writing craft in Spanish are very difficult to find, yet there is an increasing number of authors who have chosen to write in Spanish that have been overlooked by the mainstream litera litera literary scene, seen and is hungry for development opportunities and recognition. In an America where English is the dominant language, reclaiming Spanish can unlock creativity, history, and heritage. Since 2014, we have offered quality classes and workshops free and open to those who seek to develop their creative writing. We believe Spanish has a place within the cultural diversity of the city of Seattle, and therefore we promote the literature in Spanish in the Northwest of the United States. And today we are enormously proud and happy to receive a greater writer and promoter of female writers in the US, Dr. Adriana Pacheco, with whom we have organized an interesting panel of discussion. Dr. Adriana Pacheco was born in Puebla, Mexico, and is a naturalized American citizen. She sits in and is the former chair of the International Board of Advisors at the University of Texas, Austin. She is an affiliate research fellow at Lilas Benston at Texas Book Festival, featured author 2012, She has several publications in collective books and magazines and has ed edited several books among many, many other achi achievements. Adriana, thank you for being here. Welcome, Town Hall is all yours. Wow, I, this has been like a, a dream for me. I am so, so happy to be here. Seattle is an amazing city, and I, I had the feeling that people were going to be amazing, but this has been a bliss. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Seattle Escribe, for being our host in our first stop of Las Cuatro Esquinas tour. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Shinju Pai and Megan Castillo for opening the doors of Town, so, Town Hall Seattle. And also, thank you, La Sala, for ho helping, for hosting, for uh, supporting this event. Thank you, Catalina, Claudia, Kristen, Ruby, Pepe, Miguel, Antonio. It is an honor to be with you. I have been studying the, the, the path 
trying to support com community of all these people. And I think that today we will have a beautiful conversation with them. Uh, thank you to my husband that he wanted to come with me and he's bragging the same t-shirt just around there. <laughs> so it's so, so cool to have him here, yeah. It is a great pleasure for Hablemos Escritoras, Shop Escritoras team and for me to be here because we want to learn from you and share what we have discovered in our journey researching, reading, and interviewing women writers, translators, critics, and editors. My presentation will be short, just 15 minutes, so the panelists have enough time to talk. To begin, let me give you an idea of the, can I remove this thing? I thank you, thank you. <laughs> To begin, let me give you an idea of the great universe we are discovering every day in our podcast and encyclopedia. So, video. Hablemos Escritoras is a literary curatorship uh, platform conceived to spread the work of writers, translators, critics, and publishers. We are united by the passion of writing, reading, and talking about books. We have more than 300 episodes, and they have been listened in more than 50 countries. In our bookstore, online bookstore for the United States, we have a catalog with more than 600 titles, more than 60 publishing houses, and more than 150 writers from 20 Spanish-speaking countries and the United States. About 10 years ago, I was at a bookstore. I was looking shelf by shelf some books. A man next to me was doing the same. He was more or less my age, and I also noticed that he had several books in, my, uh, in his arms. After a while, to open a conversation, he told me that he never knew what to read when he wanted to learn about literature from Spanish-speaking countries. He recalled a couple of names, but not many, and I was eager to help. And immediately, I told him some titles I knew by Hispanic writers from the United States and some from the Spanish-speaking world. When I remember this story, I always think about other titles that I could have mentioned that day and some that I can mention today. And I also wonder what happened at the beginning of the 21st century that started such a radical change in the literary scene. For some, this began in 2005, with the search of an indie publishing industry interested in the work of new writers. Later, social media and internet help a new generation of literary promoters like me. Then, more and more bookstores included in their catalogs books in English and Spanish by writers that identify themselves as Chicano, Latinos, Latinx, Hispanic, Latin American, and Iberian. A change in topics, styles, and genre, genres came with a search of a different kind of reader, the one that moves back and forth between two languages, eager to understand and translate their challenging realities. The United States is a big part of this momentum. In what Ilan Stavan Stavan called in the 2600 page book, Norton Anthology, the Latino Literature, published in 2010, Latinidad, 
as the spirit behind writers who have roots in Latin America, Spain, Mexico, South America, and Spanish-speaking Caribbean countries. But many things have changed in the 12 years since the publication of the, that book. For example, Venezuela writer and scholar Naida Saavedra has called this change the new Latino boom. The Argentinian editor and writer Fernando Olsansky uses the term literatura del desarraigo, literature from the uprooting. Peruvian writer and editor Ani Palacios names this literatura fusión, fusion literature. Mexican-American scholar Silvia Fernandez talks about literatura transfronteriza, transborder literature. And Mexican-American scholar Gabriela Gutierrez Moose reminds us about Chicana writing. And in the intersection between English and Spanish, other call it Latinx lit. Magazines have helped to connect Latinos writers with those publishing in Spanish-speaking countries. I can say names like Southern Review, Literary Magazine, Los Bárbaros, and Vice Versa Magazine. And when I think about all these radical changes, I wonder whether that man I met at that bookstore has followed them along. Has he kept up to this boom, with this boom? Books in Spanish are also important, so important. So are those written in English. In the last decade, Latinx literature has given us challenging proposals. Then they have proven Kristen Millares Jung's idea that writers say what people don't want to say. Just to give you an example, in 2019, I presented Latinx writers Janine Capo Cruzet, Cali Fajardo Einstein, and Ivelis Rodriguez at the Texas Book Festival. A couple of days before that, Capo Cruzet suffered aggressions by students at the Georgia Southern University who burned copies of her book, My Time Among the Whites, a worrisome incident. At the panel in Austin, Cali Fajardo Einstein talked about another book, important book, Sabrina and Corina. And I never imagined that three years later that our online bookstore, Shop Escritoras, were going to be the one importing 30, between 30 and 50 copies of the translation of that book from Spain to a library book club in Colorado. Other writers are crossing other borders and showing the similarities of their works. I remember a conversation with Mexican-American writer Erika L. Sanchez, you know the name, author of I Am Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter, and Mexican writer Guadalupe Nettel, author of The Body Where I Was Born. In that conversation, they talked about how close literature on both sides of the border can be. Now that I have traveled to Seattle, and gone to Elliott Bay Book Company, amazing. I was reminded of that man again, the one that I met many years ago. He would have been thrilled to discover the amount of books of Hispanic writers that I saw there today. On this trip, I also discovered the beautiful, beautiful and powerful work of Claudia Castro Luna, the Salvatorian writer, and now I am curious to read her book about El Salvador, and I want to know if she can be compared in some ways with the work of Alexandra Litton Regalado or Javier Zamora. Another writer I think about when I think about transborder leadership is Sandra Cisneros, who told us at Hablemos Escritoras podcast that she decided to move to Mexico because she wanted to recover her Spanish. And he did, writing this fantastic bilingual book, Martita, I Remember You, Martita, Te Recuerdo. Belonging is a big topic in contemporary literature, as in the title of Melanie Marquez Adams in her book, Querencia. I have many other names, for example, Maria de Lourdes Victoria, Daenerys Machado, or the Peruvian author, Osvaldo Estrada. Chicanas and Chicanos writers are another source to think about this topic, 
like Gloria and Saldúa, and of course, Norma Cantú or Reina Grande. Other writers have been also questioning the stereotypes of Latino in the United States. And I think in names like Pedro Medina, Jennifer Thorndike, and now that I am almost finishing the book, Kristen Millares Jung. In poetry, one day, Cristina Rivera Garza told me, Adriana, you have to keep an eye on the group of poets of Canto Mundo. They are changing poetry, amazing, and they are. I remember that in that conversation, we also talk about Alejandro Perez Cortez, winner of the Paz Poetry Prize. I love the sensibility of two poets, Alicia Cosame and Susana Chavez Castillo, recently published in a tiny, tiny publishing house at the University of Houston, the one that, is, that has the best the Spanish cryptic writing program in the country run by the amazing Cristina Rivera Garza. I call writers like Cristina and like Valeria Luiselli bridge writers because they published in both books, in both languages, and they are constantly crossing the border. Translation from Spanish to English and from English to, Sp to Spanish is fundamental. We have many amazing writers winning international prizes, like the work of Charco Press in the United States, that they are translating work, for example, like Gabriela Cabezón Camara or Claudia Piñero. Another writer that, has been, that, that, that won that prize is uh, Fernanda Melchor. In terms of un unusual, you need really to, re to, to read Spanish writers. I think that we need to talk more about Spain, also in the United States and Latin America. We have some writers that, that write short stories, like, like Patricia Esteban or Alejandra Costa Magna. But what about lay, gay, lesbian, and transgender literature and writers? We have amazing publications by Maria Minguez, Isabel Frank, or Camila Sosa. And what about books for children and your adults? Look at this. Lily Rafferty, she is in Spain, and she talks about Asperger syndrome with books about vampires and ghosts. There are many other genres that I, we really need to talk about, like indigenous literature. Or we also have to talk about the writers that are mixing sound, design, and writing. We have also to recognize the work of translator. And I'm going to tell you a secret, but please don't tell anyone. Hablemos Escritoras will soon announce the translation of two amazing books with Catacana Ediciones, a translation by Robin Myers of the book Radicales Libres by the renowned, renowned, beautiful Mexican writer Rosa Beltran. A literary publishing house will translate with us. The translator will be uh, Dorothy Snyder, and we are translating the book Arrhythmias by Angelina Muñiz Huberman. She was the first one to win the Premio Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. When I met Valeria Luiselli at the, Texas book, at the University of Texas at Austin, 2017, I listened to one of the students saying, that she was an American writer with Mexican heritage. And I wonder, what makes a writer from a country? What is the line that divides nationality and belonging? Is language the actual border we have to cross? If we don't, if we don't rethink literature today in terms of crossing borders, we could miss the momentum and the opportunity to recommend that person at the bookstore I met many years ago, the amazing titles of more books, of the amazing production of Latino, Hispanic heritage writers, writing in Spanish, in English, and in a mix. Thank you for listening, and it's, a pleasure, it's going to be a pleasure to talk about this topic with our guests.
Thank you very much. So we have a panel that is uh, formed by almost uh, uh, something that we aspire always to, to be. We have Miguel Villen now joining us in, uh, via Zoom. So uh, let me just read very briefly and introduce you. I think uh, we will better spend uh, the time talking and, and, and chatting about uh, what you have in mind, Adriana. So today we are joined but by very good uh, poets and artists today. Claudia Castro Luna is uh, uh, with us today. She is uh, uh, the Washington State Poet Laureate of 2018, 2021. And uh, we are glad to receive you here. Please give a round of applause, please. We have Catalina Mari Cantu. She is a co-founding member of uh, the group uh, Latinx and uh, Mecha in uh, Teatro uh, uh, in Washington State. Please uh, receive her as well with a round of applause. Miguel Guillén, who is joining us from Arts Wa, who is uh, on the screen. We have already said hello. Kristen, Kristen Millares, who is author of Sus Subduction. <laughs> Jose, Luis, Jose Luis Montero, that was the previous member, uh, president of Seattle Escribe. Please, uh, and Ruby Romero, uh, who is uh, coming from Amazon, uh, joining us today uh, to speak about uh, uh, writing in the Northwest uh, of the US. Thank you, Adriana. <laughs> So I need my computer here, sorry. It's... So this is a great opportunity because I think that we have many, many things, many say, many things to say about efforts working with community, preserving a language, but also uh, preserving literature. And I want to ask Catalina, I, I was amazed seeing all the, the, the work that she is doing in La Sala, the big community they are building there. But I am sure that you might have some challenges that you have to, to solve and to cross, uh, uh, go across. Tell us about the efforts that requires to be such project like uh, La Sala. Well, uh, thank you, Adriana, and thank you, Town Hall, and everyone for showing up tonight on this April shower day. Um, La Sala is a Seattle area organization that creates and catalyzes opportunities for Latino, Latina, Latinx artists and arts and organizations. And I do want to mention that Miguel Guillen, who is on um, the screen over here is uh, one of the co-founders of La Sala. We began about 14 or 15 years ago with, and that Maria Victoria was also a co-founder. Um, one of the challenges is that the Latinx arts community in this area is comprised of multiple organizations with a specific arts emphasis, such as music, dance, or visual arts. Although each of these organizations rehearse and perform in multiple spaces throughout Seattle, there's no centralized home for Latinx arts in the Seattle area across multiple disciplines, including literary and drama. Thus, the challenge is to bring together immigrant communities with Latinx folk who have been here for generations, how people identify themselves, and incorporating Spanish and English into their artistic expression. Yeah, amazing. It's, it's really hard to connect people, getting the funding, make, having the, 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 the projects, no, and the events. So, Miguel, hi, Miguel. <laughs> what about an artist that decided to go in funding, in a, at a funding organization, to help other artists? to produce and to have more chances to, to be more visible. Tell us about that. 
Well, funding for individual artists is is one thing. So an artist can, of course, seek funding for themselves. Um, to fund an organization, um, it's a little bit different. Is If an artist is doing a project that involves other artists, um, you know, it, it depends on how they present the, um, it, it becomes a project, right? And how they present the project uh, to the funder. It's entirely possible. Uh, I think what I would recommend for anybody that's doing a project that involves various components outside of um, promoting their own work, that they speak to the program manager and go to the website of the organization, see what types of grants are available. But program managers are there to help you. We're there to um, help you solve and um, help you create narratives, help you understand the budgeting for uh, um, a program or a, a project. So when an artist is wanting to help other artists, um, you know, wh what does that mean to the funder? Are you an organization? Are you a group? Or how, how is that going to lay out? So there's various components to that. The best thing to do is to talk to the program manager and, um, you know, figure out where you fit into the, the funding scheme. Wow. Yeah. And I, I visited your website. It's amazing. So you have too, too many, many uh, people involved in that project. It was really surprising for me to know that a member of Amazon, this huge company, were going to be to, uh, here today. So thank you, Ruby, uh, for coming. And I know that you started this as a very small project, you no, know, just with, with some friends in the Latino community. So tell us how, how, how this happened, because you, you, grow, you grow up a lot, no? You grow up a lot. Yes, well, um, is this on? I think it is on. Anyways, um, well, I'm here representing Latinos at Amazon. So we are a group of um, employees at Amazon that are doing a lot of work in, in different areas. But one of the areas that I chose um, when I started this, this um, adventure was um, to bring more literature in Spanish. And the reason why is because I have a lot of people that recommended me tons of books from Latin America, and I was not able to find them <laughs> anywhere. And so sometimes I have to ask them to send them to me. And so I had, um, I, you know, I got the uh, opportunity to start working with um, um, Maria Lourdes, and, and I think that that was a wonderful thing for us to do because uh, we are going to start working uh, more into that. And so that's kind of like, uh, I started very, um, as a very small project, but now <laughs> it took off. So uh, we're doing a lot of things with, with that. And I'll, I will tell you more later. Wow. So Claudia, today I, I have to tell you that I was about to cry two times when I interviewed Claudia. Her amazing work with women uh, the community is really, really big. It was really a, a beautiful experience. And she's going to be soon with Gabriela. Uh, also, uh, Gabriela Gutierrez will be soon in, in our podcast. So, Claudia, there is an intersection between academy and writing. And many times in that interse intersection, you have the opportunity to touch the life of young people. How would you address that very important sector of our society. Yeah, I think probably the most important sector is our youth, um, both at the, well, all, all since little, right? Creating an awareness and promoting the language. Um, and, and I do think that I believe with all my heart, because I am a poet and I've served in these public roles, that we are all capable of producing literature. We are all capable of writing poems. Literature resides inside us because we have stories to tell. We have feelings, all of us, and that is what makes literature. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think part of how I see this work is trying to dismantle borders that position writers as, or writing as something that is um, you know, that you have to have academic training for, right? And making it accessible and, and relevant to our lives, not something that is 
out there, not some old Greek myth, as valuable as they are and as much as I love them, but you know what happened on the bus stop on your way to work and, and, and turning that into a story that is relevant and powerful. Um, so I see the work, I mean, and, and we're doing that work. Those of us who are sitting here uh, and you're doing that work, creating spaces to debunk barriers and really trying to get ourselves in, the, in front of youth as much as possible. Yeah. And that takes effort. <laughs> I mean, it's a deliberate effort. So true. Yeah. So true. So, Kristen, we really, really need good journalism. Journalists can be amazing. You know that I, I come from Mexico, one of the most dangerous countries for journalists in the world. So thank you for that challenge. And how do you think you are touching the life of this community through journalism, through the daily, daily work at the or places you, you write about the society? Well, it's difficult because when I first moved to the city, I worked for the Seattle Post Intelligencer. And I don't know if any of you remember that. It closed in 2009. It did serve the city from 1863 to 2009. We worked hard every day. At the time, I felt that it was so important that I was, um, that my byline, Kristen Miyar Young, was, was up top of these articles. I was the only Spanish-speaking reporter at the paper. Uh, when I was hired. I was also the youngest reporter at that paper. And so it was difficult because I wanted to be, I covered business and then I covered the port of Seattle, so the waterfront, maritime economy. And I felt that it was important that a Latina be doing work that wasn't necessarily labeled as Latinx work. Latinx wasn't even a thing at that time. Mm -hmm. Ha! I've lived long <laughs> enough to come into new identities. Ha! Um, <laughs> So I felt it was very important that, yes, I had this byline, and yes, I had this training, but I was writing about business. I was writing about corruption. I was creating the impetus for federal investigations, and that it wasn't just something that was nominally labeled Latino, but a way of thinking about uh, equality and the possibilities for uh, an informed citizenry to create um, change within our democracy, something that I had seen in my kind of family and diaspora, but at some point, you know, the Borg here is so large that it can feel hard. Like, it was, what, what's one more shoulder to that wheel, right? Who's gonna change anything? But when you realize that there is a way of thinking that may or may not have a label according, accorded to it, but does in aggregate create change that you begin to recognize the power of being a Latino within a newsroom or in other environments that are not at that time dominated by Latinos. So now, mostly I've done work for The Guardian, New York Times, but mostly right now I'm a novelist as well, so I've um, been writing book reviews. And that is much more esoteric work, right? And so um, I felt it important both to review books that are written by Latinos, uh, some people who claim it, others who don't. Like for example, Carmen Maria Machado, She's a Cuban-American writer, right? But that's not what people call her. Mm -hmm. That's not what they say she's writing about. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Valeria Lucelli, I've reviewed her books. Um, Isabel Allende, Julia Alvarez, you know, all kinds of people, Gabriel Garcia. I find it important that a Latina be available and able to review those books. And yet I also have been reviewing books that are written by people who are not Latino. Because what I would need, and what I need also is someone who is hybrid, um, is for our cultures, which are many and not monolithic, to interact and influence the cultures around us. And that takes both saturation and intensity of culture, and it takes dispersal of that culture. Um, and it's a strange work, working from the center and then working from the fringe. Yeah, yeah. You know, we have at um, Hablemos Escritoras uh, book reviews in audio and in text. And it is amazing. When you have a good, good book review, it can be a challenge. So, what a surprise to meet Pepe. If he has been amazing, working every day, every day these two weeks. Thank you, Pepe. 
And now I am very, very surprised that he comes from the IT industry, but he's very close to the community. And I know that in, at Seattle Scribe, you want to, to be close to the community. Which community and which kind of outcomes you want to have? Well, we want to be close, and Seattle Scribe, we want to be close uh, with anyone who wants to tell a story, which I believe it, it's everyone here in Spanish, right? I, I truly believe, like Claudia was saying earlier, that everyone has a story to tell. And the, the matter of the thing is, how do, you, how do you do it, right? And that's what Seattle Escribe is here for, to help people to tell their stories. It doesn't matter uh, their background. It doesn't matter if they uh, uh, have a university degree or a master's degree or have taken writing classes before. It doesn't matter if uh, uh, they typically work on the typical Latin uh, kinds of jobs, right? The, the manual labor, right? We do not... Uh, um, care about any of that. We just want people, uh, we want to help people tell their stories. And, and, and that's the kind of community we want to uh, create here. Wow, this is, this is beautiful, what you are doing there. So um, let me move to Hispanics in the community. community. Kristen, in your novel, uh, congratulations, by the way, for that book, your first novel, you are recovering voices of Latina and Hispanic. Why is, the import, is this important for you? And why are you trying to de deconstruct those stereotypes and ideas you know, around Hispanics and Latinos? Well, so it won't be a surprise to many of you, right? Cubans are like, what are we? You know, what, who, and, and how, what relation do we have with other Latinos? Like, I've got to say, I want to apologize for every Cuban that's come to national prominence over the past five years. Uh, these are not the people I would have selected uh, for that role. Um, but there's this question of privilege, right? There's a question of passing. Um, there's a question of colorism. Um, there's a question of waves of diaspora. You know, the, my family left um, under threat of Batista, right? And then couldn't go back because of Castro. Right, and so we were not the Marielitos later. Um, and I, this really wonderful book of Women in Salt, written by Gabriel Garcia, who really understands how successive waves of migration don't necessarily help each other, right? Don't even want to be considered the same thing. And so in my mind, even though for my family, I went to Harvard, I have worked for the biggest brand names within journalism, it would be very easy for, I, I married a white guy, um, you know, I'm raising my kids in Spanish, but they both have blue eyes, um, right? There are so many ways that I can easily pass and do. And so then, what is the question of privilege and how, you can never really give your privilege away, but how can you put it to work? And so for those of us who have white passing privilege, which is also a burden um, in its own way, which I won't belabor now, um, how do we create, how do abre caminos, right? for other people uh, to understand that there is a way forward that doesn't require some of the abnegation and erasure that our parents taught us was necessary to be accepted. And how do we create spaces so people feel more comfortable uh, being themselves, whatever that is, because, you know, there is no culture that has one face, nor should it. And uh, the difficult thing when one becomes like a person with a mic in the hand, right, is like how, who wants to get behind this face? I'm like, I don't want to get behind this face. I want you to get behind your own faces, right? And so just showing up and being present and realizing that you can show up and be present in whatever capacity you have, whether that be multilingual or not, whether it be with a conferred sense of authenticity from having been the immigrant oneself or the person who carried those stories at the foot of their grandmother, listening again and again and again as she spoke of her exile, right? There's all these different ways to carry these stories forward, and we each have our own role to play. So, Claudia, poetry is beautiful, sensitive, eh, fantastic, vocabulary, everything. But poetry can be a weapon. How do you use poetry as a weapon? That's a huge question. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I agree with you that poetry can be a weapon 
um, because it dares, because for it to be poetry it has to come from a deep place. And we know when it doesn't, right? Good poetry comes from a deep place. You could read it, you could see when you read a poem and feel like, eh, this doesn't quite feel that way, right? Um, and because it comes from that deep place, it's able to convey um, emotions that, as Kristen said, somebody may not want to talk about. Or um, in the case of Killing Marias, for example, that's, that's a book that's treading and speaking about the murders of women, femicide. And the way into that book for me was to really think about beauty and tenderness as a way of understanding and approximating and getting close to that issue because it is so terrible that it's very easy to turn away. Mm -hmm. And so the language in that book is working to somehow welcome the reader into it. So I think that, I think that poetry, could, and it could, the opposite could be true, a forceful poem that makes you just get in your face that then suddenly awakens you to see something that perhaps you didn't want to see or you saw but didn't understand. And so I think that it's marvelous in the ways in which it could work with feelings because in the end that's what it is. Poetry is feelings and whenever we get that impact, that wow moment when you hear a poem, that means that that transmission between the writer and their feelings to the reader and theirs has been made. And so yes, we could wield, I mean, there's a line in that book, um, you know, how to write a poem without lifting a, a rifle. And I have that poem, that line in that poem, because I come from a country where there was a revolution where people took up arms for change, for social change. And over the years, I've come to realize that maybe um, that that is not the way forward. That is not the way to do that, that there are other ways. And words are a powerful way to get to get there, um, so. Yeah, amazing, nice, nice answer. Catalina, I have seen some of your readings in YouTube, beautiful, yeah. Thank you, I didn't so, realize it was out there. Yeah, they <laughs> nice are, and I am very happy that I, I found them. So, uh, sometimes you are mix, mixing Spanish and English. Yes. So. Tell me about that feeling of saying, reading poetry and mixing those amazing uh, languages. Well, um, when I write, I write de mi corazón. And so it just, it comes, whether it's in English or in Spanish, um, I just kind of get in that moment of where, um, I'm trying to take the reader and where my heart is taking me. I, I love them. So I really recommend <clears throat> that you check uh, YouTube. Oh, and I will so, too. <laughs> <laughs> so Ruby, you're a reader. Do you have enough books, materials that you want to read? Or do you think that there is a lack? of books that are available for you in what you are doing with the community? I, um, uh, no, I don't think that we have enough. I think that we need to have more. And um, one thing that I can share about it and in terms of privilege is that uh, when I started working there, I was the only Latina in a, my, a big organization and a f very few others. And when I met somebody that was speaking in Spanish, I was like, so, like, you speak Spanish. You know, you can feel so little in that, you know, and it's like, so we, they started the uh, Latinos ad. And one of the things that we started at us was just to come together to so support each other. But then that support grew, mm -hmm. grew to our community. So now we're working with Seattle's Cribe, and we also, um, you know, doing a lot of work with the community with nonprofit organizations like El Centro de la Raza and things like that. But I, we need more, more material. Spanish, yeah, yeah. Definitely. So we are running out of time, but I have two more questions, one for Pepe and one for Miguel, I'm sorry. So, Pepe, Cristina Rivera Garza says, and Liliana Avenchushan says, that writing today is a, a work of community. 
So what do you think? Is now a new way of writing in community, not anymore for some writers, not anymore an isolated activity? Community is essential uh, to be a writer, right? When you're a writer, you are in solitude, you're working in solitude, you're working uh, against the page, right? Against the blank page. And, and the problem is that you can be in that world, like just close in that world, and uh, how do you know that what you're doing is correct, right? Like you need other people to come and tell you and help you, you know, realize uh, what are you trying to do? Because sometimes you don't even know, right? Uh, uh, it's it's really interesting. That's why we have workshops. That's why we have uh, 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 classes for writing, right? And uh, and and having somebody else to share your work and uh, to exchange your work and, and and give you an opinion, it's uh, invaluable because that shortens that amount of time that where you learn uh, what message gets across, right? Because when you're, you're when you're writing, you're you're telling a message, you're trying to convey a message, but you're doing it in in on your own against the blank page, and you're not sure that, that actually when somebody's gonna read that, they're gonna understand what you're trying to do. So community is essential. Uh, a, a writer um, cannot exist without community. And, and there's this whole myth about the great American or the great writers of all times. The reality was that they, they also had, they didn't have writing schools, but they did have uh, mentors. They, they have correspondence with other great writers, and that's how they learn, right? They, they have literary salons and uh, community is essential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Miguel, you have like 30 seconds to, uh, to answer a big question. So you told me when we, when we talked before this, this conversation a couple of days ago, that for you, Spanish, speaking Spanish is very important for communication. So what about literature in Spanish? Uh, well, what do you mean, what about literature in Spanish? Um, it's it, 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 it very important. Yeah, exactly. So I didn't finish that. So what about literature in Spanish? To have that conversation in a country that is uh, English speaking, a speaker. Um, well, my relationship to, to literature is, um, as, I, as I mentioned when we talked, is I grew up in a, in a book, in a, in a house full of books, and uh, it was both English and Spanish. And um, for me, uh, I guess what, the way I'll, I'll, I'll relate to this question is that I think that um, as, as um, uh, Claudia said, you know, there's, there's this, uh, this deep place where this all comes from. And I think that um, when I am uh, reading and I read in English and I read in Spanish, um, I, I, the reason I do that is to reach into that deep place within me and, and sort of recognize it um, um, in the writer, right? In, in, what is this writer presenting to me and what can I learn from it? And what does it say to me about the world that I don't see? And I think generally that's what art is, is to reflect the world through the eyes and soul and heart of somebody else. Uh, through uh, through a vehicle and literature does it uh, extremely well. Literature, what for me, for me, what it does is it places the um, the story, it places the emotions, it places the the visuals of the writer directly into my head, and I and I love that. I love that it it, it takes me to that place, and I can experience through my own you know experience melded with the experience of the author, a new, um, a new way of looking at the world. So when I read in Spanish, I find that I have um, that, uh, a relationship to the world within me that I tend to forget reawakens. Um, when I read in Spanish, um, the words present the world in sort of a forgotten way. Um, in sort of a way that, um, you know, living and doing business in English and basically always communicating in English, you forget a certain level of uh, what bilingualism uh, affords you in life, a, a way to look at the world. And um, so for me, um, literature in another language in Spanish, and um, as an arts funder and supporter, I would support all approaches to the way that that particular feeling that I know is exists through art and literature should be available to everybody. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, yeah. but that's what it takes to mind. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. Thank you to everyone. Yeah, thank you to, to you too. Yeah, and Town Hall. And yeah, a big applause for this beautiful panel.
And Alfonso, I have to apologize because I think that I changed your name and I didn't say properly thank you, so thank you. No, no, that's, that's correct. We are just working all together and this has been uh, an amazing time with you all. Uh, we have some questions from the public that maybe uh, have been answered by uh, this last question that you made right right now, one of them at least. But there is another one that could be uh, perhaps answered by some of you. And this is, what has been the most challenging aspect of your work? How have you dealt with that? What is the most challenging aspect of your work as a writer perhaps, or uh, in your activities, trying to help society? And how uh, important, and how, who, how has it changed perhaps your own uh, perspective of writing, your experience of writing, and also uh, the help to society that you do uh, I don't know, Claudia, you have any idea, Catalina? <laughs> well, I think w one of the challenges is that when we first started La Sala, um, people had their own art. Um, I went into it as uh, head of uh, Los Norteños Northwest Latinx writers. So, and then we had someone else representing photography. We had somebody else representing uh, drama and so the challenge frankly is that when you're an artist and you become an arts administrator how do you still do your art and so we're looking for volunteers this is my call <laughs> go to www.lasalanw.org sign up for our mailing list and we welcome everybody who's interested in the arts we love all our artists but, you know, we want our artists to be that, um, myself included, artists. And we welcome everybody, um, which is why I'm talking to Ruby, uh, about, you know, collaborations and partnerships um, with everybody in this room and who's online and who may watch this in the future. Thank you. Very good. Very nice. Uh, there is another question that I think has been answered, but I would like to rephrase it a bit uh, in terms of, uh, it says just uh, for you personally, why Spanish, when Spanish? And I remember uh, talking with Claudia and, and also uh, Miguel, that they sometime uh, told me that they were, they were feeling more comfortable doing business and talking in English. But uh, now Claudia said something very interesting. When you want to express yourself, when something comes from your heart, you, you write. So maybe that's the, uh, the question. When do you choose to write uh, in Spanish? Uh, or is it something that you choose or is it just something that comes out? I think that's a really, uh, that's a, uh, I, I like that question because in this, in this last book of poems that, that I wrote, I think I experienced that the, the most strongly um, because there were moments when I didn't realize when I switched from English to Spanish because I mostly, I write in English by choice. So I deliberately, I'm an English writer, I speak Spanish as well and have and, and do pen writing in Spanish. But writing those poems which are largely about El Salvador and my experience of leaving the country as a, as a, young, as a young teenager because of the war, I didn't know when I had switched because I am able to, the two languages collab, mix so well in my brain that I really don't know. Um, and some of those poems then, the, the last, the, there's a couple of poems in that new book where the last couple of lines are left in Spanish because that is how the poem showed up on the page for me. And because I live in the two languages, I decided that that, that, that is the way it should be. And then at that point it becomes a question of craft um, right, if we had more time to, to talk about that, when do you decide which, when to deploy a language? Because all of us here have the great fortune of speaking both, and we could go back and forth and, and choose and make that a choice, an active choice in our writing. So, yeah, well, yeah. You made me think also about, do you dream in Spanish or do you dream in, in English? <laughs> both. both. <laughs> because sometimes I tell my kids, uh, when you start uh, dreaming in English, 
that's because you have already mastered the, the language, no? But sometimes, I, I mean, I am speaking, obviously, I am a Spanish-speaking guy, no? Uh, that learned English very late in his life, so I think I will not dream of <laughs> in English myself. But let me just ask another question, which I think is very interesting uh, from the public. Have you ever had a moment when your mother tongue or your culture was an obstacle? How did you learn to embrace to embrace it, to make it part of the process of creation. Has it become, a, a, for you, uh, uh, maybe this is a question for you that you have been asking a lot of questions, maybe this is the one you want to answer. So that, my, then, uh, that my language and my culture, uh, my origins have been an obstacle. Yes, because I, like you, I learned English as an adult. Uh, I have a PhD in literature that was, of course, I write and read in English, uh, and I love English. But in terms of people, when you talk to, to Hispanics, uh, second and third generation, many of them have told me, I'm sorry, my broken Spanish. And I always answer, I'm sorry, my broken English. <laughs> and, and I think that that is something, for example, uh, that sometimes you feel, as we said, no, Catalina, mm -hmm. too aware of yourself. And that can be an obstacle. But I am almost 60 years old, so I don't care. Exactly. I mean, I have to talk. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and I promise that I take, I have my English, English teacher, Fernando, my husband, can, can prove that, twice a week. And he, he might be a very wealthy guy because he has been with me like three years or five years, I don't know, because I have to jump that obstacle and be bilingual. And maybe age is more a, a, a bigger obstacle because you think that you are running out of time. You're very hurry, no? But my, my origin, I am very proud of being a, a Mexican and born and now an American citizen. So I love both countries, both cultures, both languages. Yes. Yeah, perfect. I think I will read just the last question because I have been stopped now, no? <laughs> Let me just cross that. <laughs> well, the final question. When did you know you wanted to be a writer? Was there a specific story or a person that inspired you? Anyone? The last chance that we have, uh, perhaps, Kristen, you want to? Well, I'd like to combine this with the other question of the obstacle. Because in my house, uh, women may have done all the work, but men were the ones who made the decisions. And so the difficulty, the obstacle that I had from coming from a Cuban culture, a multi-generational home, was breaking out of the patriarchy and finding a way to lead that um, honored my respect for my elders and yet completely upended every single structure that they taught to me. <laughs> So I became a writer. <laughs> <laughs> very nice, very nice question. So with this, uh, we want to say uh, thank you, Adriana, for coming and kind of provoke this uh, talk where we want to, to find out where we are in terms of uh, the Spanish and writing uh, in the US. You know? where, where are we going? Where have we come from? Maybe those are big questions that we have not answered still, but we know that we are here and we need, and we have a lot of the things to do. And we enjoy and we love the Spanish speaking community here in the, in the US and we have lots of things to do. So uh, I would like to thank you personally and uh, in the name of Seattle Escribe for visiting us this time. I want to thank each of the members of the panel. It was really an uh, interesting talk uh, to have you here. It's very nice uh, to see so many women, no? <laughs> uh, writers, no? Most of them are writers, I, I just realized. <laughs> no? um, and Pepe, of course, no, uh, that is uh, uh, also a very good uh, poet and, and writer, uh, in addition to an IT guy. So uh, and we also want to thank uh, many other sponsors. I forgot to thank La Sala for sponsoring Bruce uh, Clayton Tom, who is in charge of the pictures. Thank you very much for uh, joining us all, all day long today. And thank you all guys for being here, for having uh, uh, the opportunity to listen to us, to these writers, and I hope that you have the chance to, to read uh, some of the work, the amazing work that these people have been doing uh, in the last, not 
five, ten years in the last twenty years, perhaps not you, Christian. Maybe. <laughs> I've been working in the city for two decades. Oh my! <laughs> so you can read her as well. So thank you very much uh, to everyone, and uh, please give yourselves a round of applause. For, and let's finish this. Yes. There, is a, there are some books, if you want to have a look and if you want to buy some, that could be very helpful as well. They, they but were, they, mine are half price because they have traveled from several countries yeah, to Seattle. So um, those uh, Se Seattle escribe. And just let me tell you, please take note, shop escritoras, hablemos escritoras, spread the word. <laughs> <laughs> let us do it. Yeah. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. And by the way, there is a, there's a book uh, called Seismic uh, from Seattle City of Literature. It's a free book, and we have a couple of uh, uh, essays from Claudia and Kirsten there. So feel free to get a free copy. Yeah.